right, today I'd like to speak to you about blazing light trails. It's going to be kind of, a, I think, the final message I want to share on kind of establishing the foundation for 2024. Um, I'm going to give you a little insight that I do want to go back and, um, and finish up in the weeks to come our study on Gideon because we're at the stage now that God will now put together this little, small, powerful, anointed army of God that will change history. And I believe that what God is doing in the body of Christ is that he's calling out and singling out those who want to become a part of this little, I don't want to say a ragtag army, but a special army that will change history in America. I really do believe that. And so today we're going to continue just this small thought on being trailblazers of light. Remember the prophetic word this morning is that when you face 2024, you, you're never going to face anything unexpected if you're expecting the unexpected. So that means there's nothing to be afraid of. If you come into every situation knowing that the Lord will provide you wisdom ahead of time, you're going to find yourself in good hands. I, I went through some of my notes last year and I came up with this one thing that the Lord kind of put out before me that I want to reintroduce. It's just this thought process on the warrior's mindset. And so I noted it for 2024, I believe that the body of Christ should have a mindset like this, that we, we allow ourselves to face challenges and we face adversity, but we allow ourselves to do it with courage, strength, and determination that we're going to see the victory. That no matter what comes our way, we're going to have victory at the end. But the character traits that are required is that we have to be willing to suffer if necessary to defend ourselves, but also others. So to be a warrior means you have to stand up and you have to do something. And so I'm going to share with you today what I believe you have to do because we don't war by natural means. We don't, we don't war with guns and, and weapons. We war in the spirit. So the value that we carry is strength and we detest weakness but we're confident disciplined and we should be very brave even in the darkest of times so in Luke chapter 10 I'm going to show you this thought of Martha and Mary Martha and Mary you know the story where Jesus is within their home and Martha like many of us is very caught up in the natural affairs of the moment. She needs to fry the chicken, get the mashed potatoes prepared, get the house clean. Everything has to be perfectly in order because the King Jesus is in her home. Mary, her sister, who should be along her side, took a different approach. She's like, you know what? He came to my house as it is. He came to my house with no expectations of fried chicken and mashed potatoes. He just came to my house and visited me as I am. And I want to hear what he has to say. So Martha and Mary took two different outcomes. And I want you to know, I believe that Martha's approach to life is healthy. That there are times in life and in the right seasons, we all are to be hard workers. We're to be very disciplined. We're to clean the house and fry the chicken and get the mashed potatoes and have all these things in order and in place. That's healthy living. But Mary's position is that she's not noted to be lazy. She just wasn't helping the sister at that moment because she found greater value in his presence than in the fried chicken and mashed potatoes. And so Martha comes and she expects Jesus to reprimand sis because sis is not helping in the everyday affairs. So we find ourselves now in verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Because Martha took a position of importance within herself, this was important to her. But the one thing that is needful. So Jesus is now going to give us instructions. He's giving her instructions, but he's giving us instructions. In this moment, there's one thing needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And so Jesus is saying, the one thing that is necessary is oneness 
with me. In 24, just like it has been in every other year, there's this priority that we all carry. I need to be one with him. Listen, when Jesus shows up in your truck while you're traveling or in your automobile or he visits you on a fishing trip, wherever, you could be walking through Walmart and his presence shows up. He didn't ask you to clean up. He chose to visit you as you are. And a lot of times we feel like we got to stop and get everything in order so that he can visit with us when he already chose to visit with me. And so what the word says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, it says, In everything you do, put God first, and he'll direct you and crown your efforts with success. It's just keeping him first. So I want to just hopefully help you, like, birth a desire, a fresh desire within your heart to attend to the word of God this year with little distraction. Man, listen, I know, my, I don't mean this in a negative way, but there are things that I enjoy to do. And I don't feel like at times that they, they compromise my ability to hear the voice of God. Like, for an example, I can have the TV playing and I can still read my Bible. But when I do turn the TV off, I'm less distracted. You understand that? So in other words, when I turn off the ability to be be distracted, then I'm not distracted. I can still hear the voice of God in my everyday affairs, but I can really hear the voice of God when I set myself aside to hear the voice of God. And I think that's where we are, at least at the beginning of this year, that we should all begin to make time to set ourselves apart when we can purposefully to hear from him, especially if he shows up unexpectedly. You don't need to go fry chicken and clean the house when he's, when he's visiting with you. He chose to visit you in your pajamas. He chose to visit you and your teeth were not brushed. You, you follow what I'm saying? Like You don't have to make it right. He chose to visit with you as you are, and you should be glad. And so be a, be a Mary that says, I desire oneness with him. And I want to just understand, Mary made her choice. Her choice was to sit at Jesus' feet for one purpose, to hear what he had to say. I have everything that I believe inside of me that when Jesus spoke to Mary and Martha and spoke to the crowds, their heart burned with fire because I know what happens when he speaks to me. How many of you can actually say that when you actually have these intimate moments, is something on the inside of you lights up with expectation? It's, some, it's just it's so miraculous. It's those moments that we have to cherish. Those are the things that we have to take note of because in 24, whatever unexpected thing shows up, if you can go back to that promise of heaven that you got in the light, you can shout it in the darkness. I think that if I, if, I, if I scanned most of you, you could come up with some testimony where when you were in a good time in life, you got this promise. And then all of a sudden, when the darkness showed up, you were able to lean back into that good time, grab that word, bring it into that dark time, and work your way right through the darkness because the light of experience now tra- trailblazed a path of deliverance. Amen. And that's what the kingdom does for every one of us. So in, in Psalms chapter 119, 105, the word says that the word is a lamp. The Bible is a container. It's a vessel. It bears fire that brings light. He says the word is a lamp Unto my feet. Why? Because I'm making a journey in life. It's dark out here. I don't always know what's before me. I need guidance. And the word is a light unto my path. So we can say then by nature the word of God is to give light to the world. 
So when God gives light to you, he's giving light to you so that you can utilize that light in the darkness. Listen, every generation is faced with its own struggles. There are compromises all over the place, but there should never be a compromise in the church. Because we sh- we're called to live by a different standard. If you ask, Pastor, why is this significant? Because you've been commanded, and I have, by the word of God to let your light shine. So it, we're called to do this, like shine the light that God gives you. You're also called to be a house of prayer where <laughs> you're supposed to be intimate with the Lord. Your, your life is supposed to be a demonstration of intimacy, Because you love God, you're commanded to, and you're also commanded to love your neighbor. So we do bear a responsibility to our generation. We bear a responsibility to our neighbors. We bear responsibilities to those all around us, even troublemakers. Do you know that the people who oppose you the greatest oppose you so that you can be their prayer warrior? I think about it. Why would God allow someone to invade your privacy if they didn't need him? So he utilized them to invade your privacy so that you could get in their business, so that you could get light to them. All right, just for thought. That's why the Bible says you're supposed to pray for your enemies. (laughs) Oh, that didn't go over very well. Psalms 119, 130, the word says this. So the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But then it says, but the entrance of thy word, the entrance of thy word into my being giveth light. It brings revelation. What does that revelation do? It giveth understanding to the simple. Well, if we go back to creation, it gives understanding or insight when I am void of form. Or perhaps I'm personally confused. Or I hit a situation where I find myself empty with no insight. Perhaps I find myself in a situation that I'm useless, shapeless, I'm dark. Just like the world was. At one point, this earth was with, it was void, it was empty. But then when the Spirit of God began to move in creative power and he brought himself to this universe, it lit up with his glory. That's what happens to every one of us. When we spend time with Jesus, the entrance of his word brings revelation and it gives understanding. Somebody say amen. Amen. So you see, God's word gives light. This is why we need the scriptures. Because it gives understanding that is to be used by the traveler that we are while we're in this earth. So what Holy Spirit does, he gives us light, the light of understanding, and he gives us meaningful use because we we're, we're sanctify ourselves. Because we separate ourselves to spend time with him, he reveals himself to us. Now in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, it says that the path of the just, now I define the word just as being undistracted and attentive to getting God's outcome. So the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. I just believe that the more we become experienced with the word of God, we become more, we become better. We become better educated. We become more sensitive to the spirit of God. I don't believe that the spirit of God has to do the same thing like over and over and over again because he's, he's wonderful. He's creative. But we get started. Like I learn from my experiences and I start with my experiences because I don't start from zero. And then when I start from my experiences, he enlightens me for a new day that will get me to tomorrow. It's so, it's so cool. It's, it's just so cool with the Lord that you never start at zero again. We're growing in grace and favor. That's why nothing should shake you. The longer you move with Jesus, now there be, listen, I'm not going to kid with you. There are moments things hit me and startle me, shake me up for a moment. 
And then I have to, I have to settle my soul. I have to bring my soul back underneath the lordship of Jesus and remind myself. I have to remind myself, he made me the heir of salvation. He's made me the head, therefore I'm not the tail. He has never failed me. He has never forsaken me. In my darkest hours, I'm still standing today. Therefore, he hath delivered me. I have been afraid before, but I got through that fear to arrive at the day that I am. So today, fear, I tell you, I'm not going to be afraid of you. I hope you get something out of that. So what we're called to is to blaze light trails. You see, we are called to be about sowing and watering God's harvest field. The harvest field is the environment around us. It's just not people, because I want you to remember something. We live in a spiritual world. It is more spiritual than natural. The natural only responds to the spiritual. So there's a dark world, and there's, a, and, there's a, and there's a light world. We are to be operating out of the light world. And when the light world, which is the righteous, begins to operate it out of the dark world, how dark is the darkness then? Because at that point, we're so confused that we're supposed to be operating out of this creative force of God, and we're operating now out of fear and confusion. And we can't do that anymore. We shouldn't do that. Or should we, when we do, we should repent and don't go back to that. So we're supposed to be about constantly sowing and watering the harvest field of God, which is the earth and the fullness thereof. And then when we work, now how do we work? I want you to see this. How do we work? We work confessions of faith. How did God create the heavens and the earth? He released the desire in words. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Now, a lot of us don't want to live by that standard. But you can't get away from it. It's just what it is. A believer who loves Jesus should not be cursing. Now, I'm not saying that to condemn anybody, but I mean, the more you, clo you draw closer to Jesus then Jesus should come out of you. And Jesus is the word. Now, was there ever a season that you stubbed your toe and said a cuss word? Uh, yes. I haven't done that in a long, long time. So don't, don't think that I did that yesterday, because that's not true. I'm just saying, we've all erred, right? We've all said dumb things. We are all human, and we're fleshly at times. But the bottom line is, that doesn't justify my maturity. I have to continue to grow. And so I'm supposed to be about confessing God's outcome so that he can make it grow. Amen. I don't make it grow. I just confess what he does and then he makes it grow. So before God gave the decree for light in the world, which we are to be doing, in the darkness we decree from the light world to the dark world, light be, and we cut into the dark world pathways so that people can come out of the darkness and travel this light path to Christ. The only way you're going to get people out of the dark world is you have to speak to the dark world, create a light path for your spouse, your children, your neighbor, so they can see the light, so they can come to the light. So before there was a decree of light, there was nothing to be desired. Before you make a decree, there's nothing to be desired of Jesus from the other perspective. Nobody out there in this world right now desires Jesus, let's just say, so to speak. But when you begin to decree into your family light trails of righteousness, peace and joy, then they can see the light of that trail, get on it, and then they can see the light. So before God made the decree of light, there was nothing to be desired. And without that decree, this world, this world, this earth was void of form. It was confused. It was empty. It was useless. It was shapeless. It was out inhabitants. No representation. 
So without light, there was nothing desirable to be seen. So right now, we have multitudes of people who are in a dark world, and there's nothing to be desired because they can't see the light. But all it requires is for the church to go to work. Why do you go to work? You find the promises of God, you get prepared, and you begin to decree what God desires. And then you tend to the flock. You tend to the world. You tend to the environment as he gives you orders. And then listen, this is how it works. You're not by yourself. So I do my job, you do your job, and in harmonious fashion, he directs the symphony. And you don't even know what's, what's actually what's happening, but in the universe, the sound is being created for revival. Amen. Can you see that? So the question that we're faced with, because listen, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. There's some crazy stuff that happened in 2020. And there's going to probably be some crazy stuff happening in 2024 because it's an election year. There's some unexpected stuff happening. The question is, we know what it looks like right now. And the, the question to everyone in this building and should be before the body of Christ is like it was with Ezekiel. Can the valley of dead, dry bones actually live? Can America regain her footing and fall in love with Jesus again? Can a confused mass of matter be formed into a beautiful world? And the answer is yes. Once the Spirit of God moves into it. But here's the good news. The Spirit of God is already here. He lives in us. And He lives with us. So look at this. Ezekiel chapter 37. So how does change come? So He said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. That was it. That was the work. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet in exceeding great army. Now, if you don't think that that's possible in the New Testament, let's look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. So, have no fear of them, for nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, or kept secret that I will not become known, that will not become known. Next. What I say to you in the dark, in the quiet moments, you and I by ourselves, Tell it in the light, and what you hear, whispered in the ear, proclaim it from the housetops. Why? Because when you speak to the darkness, you cut light paths into it. So I believe that hope arrives as the Spirit of God begins to work. How does the Spirit of God work? He gives His Word, and He works with us. He prepares us for visitations. We are called to be light blazing trail makers. And in Psalms chapter 33 verses 5 through 6, he says this, he loveth righteousness and judgment. And the word judgment there means he decrees the verdict. Do you know that today if you love righteousness at some point you're going to have to decree an outcome? Listen to me. If you love righteousness, you have to decree the outcome of righteousness. The church is way too silent. We shout about a lot of things. A lot of times we fight against each other far too much and we yell at each other and scream over each other. It's just so, you know, it's not good. But if you love righteousness, you're going to make a decree. You're going to give a verdict. And here's what you're supposed to know. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. <laughs> so, yeah, it's dark. 
but the earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord. Oh, this situation is real bad, but the earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen in 2024. What's going to happen with the election? I don't know. But the earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord. You say, well, what are you trying to get across? I have something to say. So what do I say? The earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord. And listen to me. That covers everybody. It doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter what creed, color, race. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what side of the track or the other side of the track. Everybody's covered with the goodness of the Lord. Oh, so when the unexpected comes, knocking at your door, oh, but the earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord. You say, well, what are you doing? I'm mocking the darkness because this is the inheritance of righteousness. But it goes on to say, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, and by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. In other words, it all came to pass because he said it. Maybe it's time that we begin to say it. Because there, there will be some unexpectedness coming, believe me. Because there's a world system that does not want God's way. It hates the light. But the church is still here, and you can't get rid of it. Until the church is taken out of the earth, the church is still the light bearer. And it's time for us to bear the light. I'm just telling you, I just think it's so cool. So I want you to know that I believe that the light that you carry is beautiful. I believe that the light that you carry is to bless the universe. I believe that the earth is filled with the goodness of the Lord because you're here. I believe that light reflects the, the, really the glory of the creator. I believe that light is pure, it's powerful, it's bright, it's active, and it's good. And Jesus says, when you come to him, he brings you into the light. That means you are supposed to represent him. So if light is pure, light is powerful, light is bright, light is active with goodness, then that's who you are. You see, there's power in the word of God. The word of God brings light. And the word of God is to be seen, but the word of God is also to be served. In other words, not that we serve it, but we do serve it out. We work the word. You say, this is a faith message. This is a word message. God put everything in order by the power of his breath, the voice that he gave forth. In John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, the light life or the life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. And remember, when God willed light and produced it, he approved of it. But I want you to know, before there was the sun, the moon, and the stars, the light that illuminated this universe was him. Because when you look at creation, Everything that would light our universe came in after the light. Because he's the light. And the light we're talking about right now is useful because he's useful. He's profitable. And because of him, this world is a palace and not a dungeon. This world was dark without him. And with him, his trees. Rachel took a picture the other day of um, a bundle of pecans like this, ready to be harvested. And when we took it, the, the sky was blue. And uh, it was like, you know, all that came because he breathed it into the air. And then we get to see it and eat of it. There are generations that are coming that need to eat off of what we say. We're called to be ambassadors. What does that mean? We continue the work that was laid by Christ. We continue to enforce his, his righteousness, his way of living, his goodness, his light. We continue to cut light paths into the darkness. He said, Pastor, I don't know. I'm just here on Sunday mornings because it's the right thing to do. I'm glad you're here. I really am. But you have a greater responsibility than just showing up. 
Jesus lived for you, died for you, shed his blood for you, gave everything up for you, and we can't learn how to operate in the kingdom? Come on. While we're here, we just soon do it right. Because when it's over, it's over. And you're going to give an account of what you did. The Bible says even every idle word that you spoke that had no relevance, you'll give an account for. So words are important. So why not speak his word? Final word that I have for you because I'm over time. And I'm glad you're being patient with me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. You and I are to be blameless, harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a very crooked and perverse world, among whom you are to shine as lights in the world. How? You hold forth the word of life. That's how you do it. You take the word and you make it a part of your life. Listen, I, I've become in my life, and I'll close with this. I've, I've written tons and tons and tons of stuff through my journey with Jesus. And there have been times that I can tell you that that written revelation was so vital. I'll tell you one of them, and you've heard it before. But when Kayla was a little girl and she got, uh, she, we didn't know she had an abscess in her mouth. She got hit with a swing. Her, uh, she started getting infected all over her body. The doctors actually thought there was a chance she would not make it. And um, we sat in the emergency room with a few friends waiting to hear the results. And I had my covenant book with all the promises that God gave me. And I didn't confess those promises at that moment as I needed them. I read them as a, as a, a love letter of what he promised me. I was reading, I was like, Rachel, listen to what the Lord is saying. Rachel, listen to what God is saying. Rachel, listen, it's so awesome. Rachel, listen. Because my baby was on the other side of that wall. And as we read through the promises of God, his presence came. And when his presence came, it was like he ushered the doctor in. And he says, it's going to be all right. And they told us of all the surgeries she would have to go through to get all of her mouth fixed and everything, we didn't care. Because if he could save her life, he would provide for every surgery that she would ever need. And he's faithful! He's faithful! And I shout that way because... It's true. So she sits in the back of church today, and everything you see on social media is because she is able to do it today. And she serves this ministry that way. And so I just want to encourage you today. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. Get a word from heaven. And in the overflow of life when it's time, you decree into the darkness and watch God grow it. Amen. Stand up, please. Mm -hmm.